This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns on the child welfare system and the family court system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Maria, what's up today? Today we're going to have, um, our guest on the show will be Jackie Shaw and she is speaking of her case that takes place in Texas. Jackie, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me on the program today. Jackie, can you tell us a little bit about when and how your case began and who was involved in it initially? My case began in Harris County, Texas, which is within the city of Houston is within Harris County. Um, in the 312th District Court, Judge David Farr, Judge Brent Berg, who is now deceased, and Judge Robert Hinojosa. Um, the amicus in my case was Linda Thompson. How often were you in court at that time? And when you did have court, what did they say the purpose for court was and what transpired in court? And were you able to present evidence at witnesses for your case? Um, I was in court um, on and off about every two months. Um, charged with ridiculous things, things that absolutely made no sense. Sometimes not even correct dates on charges, um, TROs filed. My attorneys, of course, could never make any of the TRO hearings. Um, none of my witnesses were ever allowed to testify. They would be left out side. Um, none of my evidence would ever be entered. And if someone was allowed to testify, most of what they stated would be stricken from the record. Um, open collusion, open witness tampering, um, open evidence tampering all occurred at every single hearing and no one did anything about it. At that point, what did the mental health professionals from the court recommend, and were you diagnosed at this time? Also, Jackie, can you tell me how that differed from what your experts and psychiatrists said, and it's my understanding that they ran tests on you for months? The mental health expert diagnosed me as being delusional and diagnosed me as being antisocial, having antisocial personality disorder. Um, this is an impossible diagnosis for me. First of all, I have absolutely no history of any mental illness. And for me to be diagnosed as being antisocial, I would have to be diagnosed with two separate personality disorders, which I do not have. So this is just a ridiculous diagnosis. Um, she openly colluded and she openly conspired in front of several witnesses at each and every hearing. Um, I also had a separate and extensive psychological evaluation done by a nationally renowned psychiatrist and his team of psychologists. Um, which states I have absolutely no mental health issues. Um, this was done over a period of months, not just a few short weeks that she slapped something together. I don't even think she wrote the whole thing to be quite honest. 
What effect did this legal abuse have on you and your children at that time? Um, they were scared. They had never been involved in anything like this before or known anything like this or been exposed to people like this. Um, they began hating my now ex-husband, fearing him, um, being fearful for me, wanting to take care of me, and um, just constantly wanting to be with me and not understanding why any of this was happening. In addition to losing your children, what did the courts take from you? The worst thing was, of course, losing my children. Um, that was completely unexpected. I just couldn't believe that this could go on in this day and this age. And in this country, I was shocked. Um, but in addition to that, the court took my home, my SUV, and gave it to my ex-husband. Um, they ordered me to pay for attorneys with my retirement. My credit has been destroyed. My good name because of arrests is now destroyed and it makes it extremely difficult to find gainful employment and to explain this to anyone. My separate property is still in that house. I was given very little time and no money to move out of the house. And, um, they even withheld my children's baby pictures from me. They didn't allow me to have them and said that they were his separate property, which is untrue. After your divorce was finalized in the fall of 2009, you were charged with seven civil contempt of court charges. What occurred during that hearing? Can you tell me about the interview between your children and the judge? That hearing was probably the pinnacle of the most horrifying bunch of junk I have ever been through in my life. Um, my former attorney that I paid tens of thousands of dollars to mysteriously backed out just weeks before I was charged, um, keeping all my money, refused to return anything, um, laughing at me on the phone. Then I had to scramble to find another attorney, which cost me another $10,000. Um, when I entered the courtroom, there was in front of the associate judge collusion, witness coaching, um, telling witnesses how to testify. Um, of course, the mental health expert was brought back in, even though it was way past her shelf life because she, there's a time limit on how long they can testify and she should not have been allowed to testify. She was laughing at me, snickering at me. Um, everyone, the, Bailiff had pictures uh, and was laughing at me. He had toys that belonged to my children on his desk. And as I sat there waiting for the hearing to begin, I noticed that supervised visitation forms for the Victims Assistance Center were strategically placed on a wheel and were turned to face me. Um, Several of my witnesses were not allowed to testify. No one was allowed in the courtroom to sit there and support me while I was going through all of this. Um, prior to the hearing occurring, my children were brought to Judge Hinojosa. He interviewed my children. He did not have a videographer there. He did not have a court reporter there. This is a violation of the law and the civil rules of procedure. When my children told him everything that they had been going through and told them that I was primary caretaker and that they wanted to live with me and continue to live with me, his only response to them was, you won't be seeing that much more of your mother from now on. This devastated them. 
they felt responsible. They felt like they did something wrong. Um, I hadn't, I didn't see them from the time of the hearing for about six months. Um, and they just kept apologizing and crying and they felt bad. They thought that this was their fault. Um, I was charged at the hearing with having parental alienation syndrome. Um, the mental health expert looked at me and laughed and said, she, she said, <laughs> she's an alienator. And they were all looking at me and smiling. It was the creepiest thing I have ever been through in my life. Um, I was charged with seven contempt charges and none of the charges even coincide with actual dates that coordinate with a day on the calendar. It was as if they did not even care what was written on the page. I'm sorry, I was put into supervised visits with the Victims Assistance Center. Since 2009, what did you discover about the order of the courts? And can you tell me where you went to attempt to get assistance in your case? Since the order, I, I tried, I attempted several times to pay the contempt charges against me because it threatened jail if I did not pay, which scared me. I didn't want to go back there. Um, but every time I went to go pay, no one would accept my money. No one understood why I was trying to pay. There was apparently nothing entered. So I went on the county clerk's website and started to do some research. And the not only is the order illegal, it's an illegal modification, it's not signed. So for the last almost six years, I have just been being bullied and manipulated out of seeing or having contact with my children. Because according to the law, that order does not exist. I, I went to the FBI. I researched Harris County and attempted to contact people who had been investigating the courts in Harris County in the late 90s. Um, I had no help, no compassion from them. Um, they just turned their back on me. I attempted to go to the state bar. The state bar did nothing. Um, I attempted to contact people who had investigated with the state bar who had investigated my ex-husband and his law firm in the past and I received no help from them. I attempted to contact the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was told that I could not report federal crimes without having an attorney, which is not true. Um, I've, I've gone to every possible source I could think of to try to get help for my children and I, and no one, no one will help you. I've gone to local law enforcement, nothing. On January 16, 2016, an incident occurred at your ex-husband's home. Can you tell me about that incident and what took place? Um, my ex-husband's son from his first marriage shot and killed what I initially thought, who I initially thought was my son. Um, he Actually, upon arriving at the crime scene, um, I found out that he shot his other half-brother um, by his mother. I um, entered the home. The investigating officer interviewed me. Um, that was where I discovered that um, my son had been illegally removed um, from the state without my knowledge or permission and no one I, I began questioning officers at the crime scene um, to find my son and to find out where my daughter was I knew where my daughter was um, 
I had friends who saw her at a volleyball tournament in San Antonio and they called me. Um, but my son is still to this day missing. Now, do you know where your children are right now? Has anyone contacted you as, as to the location of your minor children? No, no one has contacted me. Um, I have not heard from my children. My son attempted, he attended the funeral of his half brother's other brother. And he was only in Houston for one day and he attempted to talk to a neighbor and was physically restrained from doing so. Um, the Houston police department has not contacted me, which is worrisome because I don't see how you can do a proper investigation without talking to the former stepmother of the person who committed the crime. Um, no one from the Houston police departments, no one from precinct one has contacted me. My ex-husband has not replied to emails, phone calls, text messages. It's going on almost four months now. And Jackie, what does your ex-husband do for a living? Who did he work for at the time and where is he working right now? He was an attorney at in Houston, Texas. He also worked as a reserve deputy constable with Precinct 4. He was recently promoted to captain and he is currently working at Precinct 1. He also works as an agent for a security company. Since the shooting, have you been contacted by your ex-husband at all? Not at all. Have any of your efforts to contact your ex-husband, the courts, the constable's office, or the Houston Police Department been successful? No. I, um, my husband and I emailed Linda Thompson, the amicus. She washed her hands of the entire thing. She was going with when she was released after our divorce was final in 2009, even though she's the one who put me in those supervised visits. Um, she was behaving as if that, that other order didn't exist. When I asked her to please report her knowledge of gunplay in the house to the court, I mean, to the Houston Police Department, her only reply was good luck. Has your ex-husband attempted to offer any explanation about his actions over the last nine years? No, never once. My children have asked him repeatedly why are you doing this? Why are you doing this with us? And the only answer he ever gave my kids was, your mother knows very well why. I don't know. I have absolutely no re idea why anyone would do this to anyone, to their own family, their own children. This makes no sense to me. When was the last time you were able to see your children? I saw my son a year ago this coming May through the knot hole in the fence. About every three to six months, I go and try to see them through the fence at my former neighbor's home. Um, then in November of last year, I took my daughter, their half-sister, to the neighbor's house again in an attempt to see my kids through the fence. And my neighbor was just so disgusted with the whole thing. She walked next door and knocked on the door. My daughter was home. She got to see her sister. That was the last time I saw her. She was in the street walking back with my daughter. It was really hard not to run up and see her. Has the court themselves offered any suggestions to correct the issue of you? 
the fact that you couldn't see your children despite having joint legal custody? The judge in my case non-suited my case, which means he's washed his hands of it. It's out of his court. He's closed this case, which means it's, it's, if I were to file something, if I had any money left or any credit, I could choose a different court. I was originally in a completely different court, and without my knowledge or permission, I was flipped into the 312, I guess because it was more favorable for him. But... Um, from what I understand, the other courts aren't any better. So my main goal right now is to try to find my son and my daughter and to contact them and to make sure that they're okay and so that they know I love them and I'm worried about them. I am so sorry for what you have been through, Jackie. Is there anything else you would like to add um, to let our viewers know? This, these are my children, Elle and Noah. Elle and Noah. And Noah is either in Maryland or Massachusetts somewhere. So if anyone recognizes him, um, I would really appreciate knowing where he is. Um, one more thing I would like to add when the shooting occurred, um, several people who are friends of mine in several groups interested in child safety try, attempted to contact the Houston Police Department and they were more interested in protecting my ex-husband from prosecution and my former stepson than in investigating um, the incident and that uh, that to me was the most horrifying thing. It, it doesn't make me feel very safe. I just want to thank you, Jackie, for coming on the show and being a guest. I'm, I'm sure this has been a really difficult story to share with everybody, but we appreciate you being here. Sorry. Thank you for having me. I am extremely grateful for this opportunity. I am shocked at how many people are going through this and are being subjected to this. We'll be back after these messages. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at mi parental rights at gmail.com that's mi parental rights at gmail.com <laughs> Good evening. Tonight's category, Baby LK's Top 10 Favorite Lawsuits Against the Child Protective Industry of All Time. Number 10. In September of 2007, a 12-year-old girl was awarded $788,000 from the state of Florida. This after being molested by a child protective investigator named Lewis Templeton when she was 5. Then in April of the following year, the state of Florida files its own lawsuit in an attempt to get out of pain. Number 9. In January of 2010, the parents of the child who was raped by a foster child they took in settles for $775,000. This because the Office of Children and Youth in Erie County, Pennsylvania, places a sexually abusive child in their home without warning them of his past. Number 8. The mother of Tyler and Ariana Payne settles for $1 million. This because the Arizona CPS sent them to their doom. Their father, Christopher Payne, was later sentenced to death for starving them. Number 7. In 2007, a mentally retarded 15-year-old who was impregnated by her foster father wins a settlement of $1.2 million. Of course, pending an act of the legislature, Florida held that up too.
Number 6. In March of 2010, 11 kids who were forced to sleep in cages by their foster parents reached a $1.2 million settlement with a county in Ohio. Lawyers for the children claimed that social workers missed several red flags that should have indicated the children were in danger sooner. The foster parents argued that the kids were special needs and this was necessary for the safety of themselves and the other kids in the home. And get this, prior to their conviction for felony child abuse and endangerment, these idiots tried to reach a compromise with the state to get the kids back. Number 5. An Alaskan boy is awarded $1.5 million in a failure to protect case after workers ignored several abuse complaints. Number 4. In Washington, two women win a $2 million settlement based on the claim that they were sexually abused in a foster home when they were five. These allegations were never proven and the foster parents were never criminally charged. <coughs> Number 3. Also in Washington, $6 million was awarded in the Tyler De Leon case. Carol De Leon tortured and starved several children in two states and Tyler De Leon died just before his seventh birthday weighing only 28 pounds. In March of 2010, Carol De Leon walked out of prison after serving three years of a six-year sentence. <coughs> Number 2. Eight children in Washington win a $10.5 million settlement for being placed with a foster molester who is now doing a 26-year jail sentence. And the number one top 10 lawsuits against the child protective industry of all time is Marissa Amora, who suffered permanent brain damage while in foster home, wins a $26.7 million settlement from the state of Florida. Of course, in keeping with Florida's history of non-payment, the girl has yet to receive her money. For these stories and all the latest dirt on the child protective industry, visit www.legallykidnapped.com. And until next time, this is Baby LK, over and out. And I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.